Uh, welcome to this brief broadcast on theorizing. Uh, the lecture should take about seven minutes. I want to begin by thanking everyone for the comments on the syllabus. I've re revised the course agenda and added dates. While it's not perfect, we are on much firmer ground than we were last week, and I'm very grateful to you for your input. We can always tweak as we go along. Uh, nothing is in concrete, but, but we do now have a, a really firm foundation. So with this overview lecture, what I really want to do is introduce you to the idea of theorizing or some of the issues inherent in designing and developing and communicating with students the teaching and learning process of sociological theory. Omar Lazardo recently published uh, an open book paper on teaching theory, and he noted in the paper how challenging this is, or how challenging it has become, borrowing to a certain extent on the work of Richard Swedberg. There is an important article by Swedberg on the course site. It's a little difficult. I do have a PowerPoint lecture if people are interested in reading part of that article. But what Swedberg notes is that we place a great deal of emphasis in the social sciences on teaching research methods, and we pretty much know what we want students to learn or what students should know at the end of a research methods course, what skills and procedures, what they should be able to do. And this has resulted in a considerable amount of consensus on, on research methods courses. We haven't quite done the same thing or figured out quite the same thing with sociological theory courses, that is, what to teach or how to teach it. So the first question, and I think this is one that we will be addressing throughout the semester, is what is a theory? Well, it's the outcome of theorizing. It's theory construction. But what is this? We might begin by thinking about theories as a genuine and conscientious systematic effort to use what we already know, plus our minds, to understand and explain social realities. Is it a purely cognitive process? Is it simply a reflective thought process? Does it consist only of rational explanations? Is it a purely mental exercise? Does it start with observation and concept formation or with the work of other social scientists? Since our categories and concepts condition what we see, as everyone who's taken uh, a course in ethnography knows, uh, we want to kind of get as close as we can to just what's out there without using concepts at the beginning. So since those concepts condition our perception, we, we're always raising the question of where our mind and our categories and our language leaves off and where the empirical properties of the phenomena under investigation begin. This is particularly difficult in the social and behavioral sciences. Social, social theorizing or social theory was much easier in the heyday of logical positivism. That provided us with a cogent set of steps in the logical deductive model. And this model appears in every single textbook in research methods and probably every single textbook in introduction to sociology or psychology or any of the um, behavioral science disciplines. What Karl Popper asked quite some time ago in Logic of Inquiry is, does this model, or these steps, does this represent uh, logic in use or reconstructed logic? That is, is this really hindsight that records and articulates an explanation of the very, very messy business of the natural sciences or the social sciences? Uh, to, to make this point, to drive this point home, if you haven't read it, read something about the discovery of, of DNA by uh, James Watson and, and Crick, and, and you'll quickly see how very, very messy uh, that process was in coming up with the theory of DNA. So there's not, not that much consensus now on how well the process or the logical deductive mo model really describes what it is we do in the process of discovery or, or theorizing, or what theorizing really is. And it does create a, a somewhat narrow and artificial focus. Uh, mathematical sociologist James Coleman used to always joke about the 
the, uh, the empirical sciences of the quantitative methods, the logical deductive model in sociology, even though he was deeply committed to it, he would always say, well, if it's interesting, it can't be studied by this method, and if it can be studied by this method, it's not very interesting. Uh, he'd always said this tongue-in-cheek since he, he really was quite devoted to empirical social science and the idea of sociology or the possibility of sociology as a science. So now we're back to, so what do we teach in a theory course? All too often, as Lazardo notes in his article, the theory course becomes a single opportunity to cram into one semester the history of all sociological theories, all sociological theorists, there are each of them who wrote about 20 books is, is summarized in a paragraph, and, and put this alongside of some ideas about theorizing and how they might be put to use to, to, do a, to examine and explain contemporary social realities. It's difficult to avoid this, on the one hand, uh, because there's, there's kind of a tradition of doing social theory courses this way, but it doesn't usually lead to a very satisfying student experience. So let's start by thinking of theory as a cognitive form of meaning making, as a set of learned skills that help us explore and make sense of the empirical world systematically, using concepts, reason, logic, in ways that can be shared and then tested and corroborated through the work of others. Theory begins with observation. But reading what others have said about social realities provides us with words and concepts that help us to see more when we observe social reality. I guess it's a, a long, fancy way of saying, well, you still have to learn some of the concepts. You still have to memorize some things. You have to read the prior theorist. But hopefully by reading these theorists and discussing key ideas with each other, and at the same time, applying what you're learning to um, a relevant sociological problem or issue will bear fruit in the form of a very satisfying teaching and learning experience for both of us. I know you do this in a lot of your courses, but in SOCH 331, we presume that you've had some practice, that you have developed some observational and analytic skills. So don't upload your social 101 paper. You can develop that idea and maybe, you know, because you should have learned something by then. You should have far more uh, observational and analytic skills when you write your social 331 paper than you did when you wrote your social 101 paper. But, you know, again, you can see that, that the idea goes across many of your courses and, and that's what we would like to provide for you as a continuity of your learning experience. So the timing is perfect. Many people think the world is completely coming to an end and that our society is falling apart. Individuals and networks and groups are increasingly overpowered by what Norbert Elias would have called centrifugal processes or forces. These are the opposite of centripetal forces. Uh, if you think about this in an organizational way, organizations sometimes become more centralized Sometimes they become more decentralized, decentralized with these centrifugal processes. And, and, and many people think that there's so much, so much decentralization or centrifugal force at work that, that we really don't understand each other anymore. We don't understand what's going on and we can't make sense of uh, the social world. There's just too much fragmentation, way too much polarization. So, and, and it's true, our country and the world is deeply polarized. But these are conditions that might give rise, and better than any other way, to, to what really holds a society or an organization or a people together. What lies beneath the surface that binds people in some way that can be observed and explained? It binds some people, but not all people. So what we're really looking for is the substance of sociology. Uh, this week, we'll begin with Pierce's understanding of abduction, uh, plus two theories, one from the natural sciences and one from sociology. And, and the questions we'll be raising are, what is abduction? Are these theories? And are they any good? Hopefully, 
This brief introduction will help you see theorizing as an activity rather than a set of answers to be memorized. Remember, you're not the first person who has ever thought of this or questioned the reality of, of the substance of sociology. It's interesting. Most people do find it interesting. But it's always good to develop your ideas by reading the ideas of others. And that's a big piece of a sociological theory course. So I'm, I'm very much looking forward to working with you this semester. Uh, please, the, the, the syllabus and the agenda are not locked in concrete. Always feel free to contact me or send me an email posted to the Ask Your Professor forum. And uh, I hope you have a great Labor Day.